Good day everyone. Uh, this is Mel Pensker. I'm the co-president of the Movie Night Club here at um, VDC. And it is my pleasure to do a special comm commemoration for all the veterans, male and female, who served in our armed forces from the Revolutionary War all the way to the present. I'm going to focus in, in, in particular, on the uh, Second World War, which uh, I've collected many things of uh, over the last 30 years. But actually, I want to uh, definitely allow all veterans to understand how proud we are of their accomplishments and unfortunately for the families and for the veterans that passed away in particular. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to uh, show some of the movies that incorporated the time period between 1944 and 1945, which is approximately the last year of World War II. And then I have some of the actual uh, newspapers of that time period. And then I have some special memorabilia that has been either donated to me or collected by me over the years in regards to the different branches of the service. So please join along with me here as we first take a look at some of the movie memorabilia. Um, this is a, a French poster of the Flying Tigers. France, um, unfortunately, at the beginning of the Second World War, was taken over by Germany. As a matter of fact, most of Europe was taken over by Germany and the Nazis uh, by, uh, by 1940. So the areas that they owned in Asia, like French Indochina, which would today be uh, Thailand, uh, were also taken over by the uh, Jap uh, Japanese uh, as a result of their invasion of the Asian ma um, mainland. And the Americans came in here and volunteered their services in this Air Force before the United States actually participated in the Second World War. And then they continued their participation throughout uh, World War II. Moving along. I'm looking at... Um, these two posters off to the side here. One is the Eagles over London. Um, the not, Nazi Germany attempted, of course, to uh, take Great Britain out of the war. And that as a result, uh, during the period uh, between 1939 and 1942 in particular, they bombed the living daylights out of um, London in particular, but eventually the RAF, which is the Royal Air Force of Great Britain, gained control of the skies. Uh, this particular movie deals with that episode. Uh, a key event in uh, American history, once the United States gets involved in the Second World War after uh, Pearl Harbor, um, is the taking of islands uh, that would allow their planes to get close, as close to Japan as possible. And one of the key places that were taken by the United States Marines in uh, 1944 uh, was the island of Iwo Jima, which will allow, uh, it, which had an air base on it, and which will allow the American um, airport, uh, air, air, uh, Air Force to have the opportunity to then hit Japan on a daily basis. 
Um, the next poster we're going to take a look at is the movie Battleground. And this is the story of the Battle of the Bulge. This is the last major offensive of the uh, Nazis in December 1944 and January 1945. They almost succeeded because we were not prepared for uh, the onslaught and the weather conditions were so bad that the United States Air Force, which now was controlling the skies by 1944 and 1945, could not uh, um, force the Nazis from bending the bulge that they created when they hit the American forces here. Incidentally, this event occurred in a place called Bastogne. Bastogne is a small city in Belgium where most of the fighting that occurred um, uh, basically here. And Fortunately, the um, American troops stationed there were able to hold out until General Patton's troops came up from the south and the weather then changed which allowed our airplanes to hit the uh, German forces and push them back into Germany. And that was it. This was the last major battle. Uh, major battle, I should say, of the uh, Second World War. Moving on. This is the movie Memphis Bell. Um, members of the United States Air Force had a mandatory 25 missions that they had to serve before they were allowed to, the option of, um, of moving, of, of, of not having to go on these bombing missions. The um, bombing missions that we're looking at here were primarily using large bombers like the, this is a B, uh, B-17 or a B-24. The problem with these bombers is they could carry a lot of bombs, but they were too slow. And initially, uh, the death rate was unbelievable. As a matter of fact, percentage-wise, more American members of the United States Air Force lo lost their lives than any other group within the United States. Um, United States Army. Um, Percentage-wise, one out of every three um, Americans who flew over Germany and they were attempting to hit the Ruhr River Valley of Germany where most of the German manufacturing was going on died. One out of three. It's amazing. Um, but as the war progressed uh, into um, 1945, um, we basically wiped off, off the Luftwaffe, which is the uh, Ger German Air Force, and we brought in uh, P-51 uh, fighter planes, which protected the American uh, bombers. Uh, this is the story of their 25th flight in this movie uh, before, of course, uh, they had the option of uh, not having to fly over the Ruhr Valley, uh, which is located in central Germany, so you had to go through a large part of it to get to the areas that they were going to bomb. Uh, and they were very successful in wiping out the uh, manufacturing areas. Not only that, but they also hit areas where Germany was working to develop an atomic bomb. And because of uh, their success, Germany did not succeed, of course, in developing an atomic bomb. 
Whereas uh, we will see in some of the newspapers I'm going to show you, uh, we did a tremendous amount of work in a very short period of time to develop an atomic bomb which will end the war, of course, in the Pacific. Continuing on, the next movie that I want to take a look at and show you a little bit about is considered one of the 15 greatest movies ever made. This is the story of three Americans who fought in the Second World War and then came back to the States and had to go through the experience of bringing their life back to sanity, basically. One was a member of the Army, another the Air Force, and another was a sailor. What complicates the movie dramatically is that the sailor in this movie, uh, unfortunately, um, was burned in both arms and had them amputated. And the uh, motion picture company, uh, MGM, which did this movie, didn't know how to handle that situation. And so on all the original movie posters like this one, and all the lobby cards that were made, they don't show his hands. Uh, they didn't know how the public would react to the situation. But I have to tell you that if you've never seen this movie, you must make an effort to see that it is so, so well done with a tremendous cast. And at one time it was uh, the second largest uh, winner of Academy Awards. Continuing, um, uh, I mentioned to you that it was necessary for the United States in the Pacific to um, gain as many of these islands on the way to Japan and the Pacific. At first they started taking as many islands as they possibly could and then they realized that the Japanese between the end of the First World War in 1918 and up to Pearl Harbor in 1941 um, started taking over all of these islands and building uh, special fortresses and bringing troops into these islands and it would have been too difficult for the United States to take all these islands. So instead of taking um, many islands in a row, we decided in our strategy in the Pacific to uh, just take the islands that we felt were most strategic. And as I mentioned earlier, um, Iwo Jima was one of those islands because it had um, a, an air base on it. The other one was Okinawa. Once we got gained, or, uh, gained control of those islands, uh, it was very easy to bomb the Japanese uh, mainland. And uh, we'll get into some of that as we take a look at some of these newspapers that I happen to have. So from here now, I'm going to work my way back. And we're going to start uh, looking at some of the newspapers that I have set up here. And they're basically set up in chronological order. And we're going to start, of course, with June 6th, 1944. And this is, of course, D-Day. The newspapers that I'm using here uh, are all from the Midwest. I'm a former resident of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, and so you're going to see um, the Milwaukee Journal, which is the nighttime uh, version of their newspaper. And you're also going to see the Milwaukee Sentinel, which was the morning version of theirs. And you're also going to have a couple of Chicago Sun-Times in here as well. So you're looking at a Chicago Sun-Time in here. The neat thing about these newspapers is not only they, do they have uh, tremendous uh, headlines to them of significant events uh, 
in American history during World War II, but I actually have the contents of, of the entire newspaper. Unfortunately, I can't show them all to you, but there are so many things in here that as you read through these newspapers, give you some great idea of what life was like during this time period in 1944 and 1945. So this is the invasion newspaper. We finally are at a point where the Allies, and when I say the Allies, I'm talking about the British and the Americans are ready to invade the mainland and, and hit the uh, Nazis in, uh, on the northern coast of France. And of course the invasion, uh, unfortunately with a great loss of life, was successful in uh, gaining a foothold in France and from there moving on. Remember, this is now June of 1944. The war in Europe is going to be over in less than a year from now. So the Allies established this foothold and are going to sweep their way through uh, Europe all the way up to the borders of Germany by uh, January of 1945. Uh, the next uh, newspaper I want to show you is a Milwaukee Journal newspaper. Unfortunately for America, the president, the four-term, the only four-term president in American history uh, passed away. And as a result, The vice president, of course, becomes president under these uh, circumstances, according to the Constitution. Our vice president was a former senator from Missouri by the name of Harry S. Truman. He, had, he did not participate in the um, conferences that uh, Roosevelt did. There were five conferences. So five conferences were held between the Allied leaders between 1933, 1943 and 1944. And these conferences involved at first the British and um, their Prime Minister, Mr. Churchill, and of course Roosevelt. Um, the Russians were also involved, keeping in mind that the Russians early in the Second World War had signed a non-aggression aggression pact with Germany, but Germany broke the, pa the uh, pact by um, invading, of course, Russia. So Russia became an ally in the United States, of course, during this, the uh, Second World War. And so Joseph Stalin had representatives at these uh, first two conferences, which were the Casablanca Conference and the Quebec Conference in January and August of 1943. But then the next three conferences that were held um, Joseph Stalin attended directly. And in these conferences, they decided on how they were going to divide up uh, Europe as a result of winning the Second World War. And by 19, late 1943, we had a pretty good idea that the Allies were going to win the war, primarily because we were able to produce more than our enemies could. Now when you stop to think about that, we're talking about all the changes in particular that occurred in the United States. The automobile plants, as an example, stopped building automobiles. What did they build? Tanks, jeeps, all different types of mechanisms that could be used to produce a war. Um, the country made tremendous strides in the area of aviation. All the 
companies that you would be familiar with today like Lockheed Martin and Boeing, etc. They all jumped in and they built uh, different planes that gave us great advantages over the enemy during the Second World War. So, although Roosevelt was dead, and Truman, as inexperienced as he was, did not attend any of these five conferences. As a matter of fact, and this is a shocker to many people, Truman did not even know as vice president. Remember, he was um, first time vice president, elected in 1944, Roosevelt already was very ill. Roosevelt, as a result of being so ill, did not communicate a lot of information to Truman. Truman didn't even know uh, that we were building an atomic bomb. And so all of this is going to fall in the lap of uh, President Truman to decide the fate of what we were going to do in the last part of the war. Um, continuing from here, as the war progressed to an end, a lot of the loot that the um, Nazis were accumulating was discovered by American troops as they entered uh, Germany. And they were in salt mines, they were hidden away in castles that they knew the Allies were not going to bomb. Um, and, of course, uh, as we worked our way into Germany, we found the uh, concentration camps that uh, were a shock to so many people of the butchery that was used by the Nazis uh, on their prisoners. Finally, as we approach Berlin in 1945, the word comes out of Berlin, which was now surrounded by the Russians, that Hitler had died. Now, because the Russians were there and the Americans and French and the British were not, We did not know what happened to Hitler. All we knew is that he was dead. And so, actually, the newspaper you're looking at here, uh, the headline on it is false, because we know that Hitler did commit suicide. Now, when the American troops entered Berlin, and were, the Allies are going to divide Berlin into different sectors, four different sectors. Um, there's a lot of, the Reichstag, which was the equivalent of the, of the German uh, Congress, um, was scattered, literally, the building was scattered all over the place, and people were coming in and out of it, and quite frankly, they were taking souvenirs. So I had the luck of having someone donate to me the stationery of Adolf Hitler. And if you look real closely in the corner, you'll see the official stamp of the uh, Nazi party on it. And um, this, is, this was a wonderful donation, actually by a resident here in Deacon Creek. So that basically by May, oh, excuse me. By May of 1945, the war in Europe has ended. And VE Day is declared. Uh, what makes this uh, newspaper very unusual is most of the newspapers at this time were very brittle, put on cheap paper, and never do you see any technicolor on them? But the Milwaukee Sentinel was so thrilled on this day that they added a slight amount of technicolor to the notice of the fact that the war in Europe was over. VE Day, uh, 
create a tremendous amount of parades and celebrations uh, throughout the United States. And I'm sure the community that you lived in celebrated like everyone else at that time. The um, final piece that I have up in the front here are all the major conflicts or battles that were fought in Europe and in Africa during the Second World War, and then all the major conflicts and battles that were fought in the Pacific at the uh, end. Well, we've eliminated uh, the Nazis by May of 1945. That leaves us with the issue in the Pacific. And the Russians, at one of these conferences, agreed that they would um, participate and invade Japan if they were able to successfully defeat Germany. But that was done before we developed an atomic bomb. And so Russia, quite frankly, um, stepped right in here and they started taking chunks of Manchuria, in particular, and northern parts of China, um, based on the agreement that they made with Churchill and Roosevelt. And so this really is the start of the Iron Curtain in Europe, because also in Europe they seized good portions, almost all of Poland, among other things, and many of the other countries surrounding Poland. So, um, what I want to take a look on up here is the events in the Pacific. As I mentioned earlier, the United States tried to take as many islands as possible and realized that the loss in um, manpower was not worth the effort of taking all of these islands. So, the United States decided to be very particular in 1944 and in 1945 of what islands they wanted to take. And strategically, what they tried to do, since they now controlled the seas, our Navy defeated the Japanese Navy and pretty much wiped them totally out, and most of their Air Force also. They began taking the islands as close to Japan as possible. I mentioned earlier Okinawa, as well as uh, Iwo Jima, and I can throw in Guam there as well. And finally, in 1945 in July, we fired off at Alamogordo, um, New Mexico, a successful atomic bomb. And we then transported that atomic bomb by sea in a um, uh, ship, the Indianapolis, over to Guam. And from Guam, we moved it closer as possible. We warned the Japanese that something awful would happen if they did not surrender. We dropped leaflets over their cities. There was no indication of surrender that put Truman in a position where he had to decide, do I risk sending American troops into Japan at the cost of what many estimated might have been as much as a million lives? He decided that he would drop an atomic bomb over Japan. And so, in August, August 6th, to be exact, the United States is going to drop a bomb, an atomic bomb on Nagasaki, or excuse me, Hiroshima. Um, we offered surrender provisions to the Japanese. They refused. Two days later, we dropped the atomic bomb, a second atomic bomb on uh, Nagasaki. Several days after that, the Japanese sued for peace, and the war ended on the battleship uh, Missouri in September of 1945.
here's the newspapers commemorating the event of the end of rationing and we're going to look at some of the actual rationing booklets that were uh, set up throughout the war itself and of course General Douglas MacArthur who is commander of the Pacific uh, fleet and army will become the ruler of, uh, of Japan. The Japanese finally decided on surrender because they feared that their emperor would be brought to trial for uh, mass murders uh, that were carried out by the Japanese, but the United States decided that it was best that we keep the emperor in power, but we wound up punishing many of the uh, generals in the Japanese army uh, after the war itself. As far as uh, deaths are concerned, more, more people died in the Second World War than in any war in the history of the world. We don't know the exact numbers of those who died, but the estimates, which I believe are quite accurate, are that about 70 to 85 million people died in the Second World War. And quite frankly, more civilians died in the Second World War than um, people in the military services. The United States, unfortunately, we lost 415,000 plus people during the Second World War between Europe and the Pacific. But other countries, such as uh, Russia, and of course Germany, and Japan, um, of course, had greater, greater uh, casualty rates. Um, because there was so much fighting within those countries as, as a result uh, of what was happening. I'd like to take a moment and show you some of the World War II memorabilia that I have on the table here. Um, let me uh, bring your attention. These are ration books that you see on the left and on the right here. And we did a tremendous amount of rationing during the Second World War. In, and I'm talking about from necessities like um, uh, different things like gasoline, as an example, uh, fruits and vegetables, meats. Uh, the gasoline probably was the best example because the General Motors and the Chryslers and the Fords, they converted all their assembly lines to build tanks and Jeeps and any other type of vehicle that would be a necessity to fighting the war. So it is rare, I might add, that for you to find a, a uh, common vehicle um, that was built in 19... 1942, 1943, 1944. Near the end of 45, they started building vehicles again, but um, there's just none that were built during that particular time period. And of course, people uh, spent more time at home. They set up victory gardens in their neighborhoods if they didn't have the room to build them, like in a city like New York. Um, they would build them on the rooftops of, their of the buildings that they were living in. Of course, those people who lived in smaller communities could build a victory garden and provide all the fruits and vegetables possibly that they needed because they were in such scarcity during this time period. It was an amazing time in American history, and Americans stepped up and they came through, but at what kind of a price did they pay for what happened during that time period, as well as all of our allies? May we never 
have to go through anything like this ever again. So, thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Again, we are so, so pleased. I am so pleased in honoring our veterans from all the wars in America. And um, God bless America. And God bless these men and women who helped our, protect our democracy. As you look at these, these are insignias, incidentally, of um, different uh, members of the Air Force, United States Air Force. You, this is not a real helmet. This is a parade helmet. This is an actual bugle that dates back to, I'm not sure when, it's definitely the 1940s. Uh, you've had a chance to take a look at the um, uniform that I have over on the side here. And I hope you enjoyed the, what I've shared with you. Thank you so much for your attention.